Hey everybody, Teching and Barry back again. And you want to know something weird? I have yet to make a dedicated video about all of the seven warlords. Well, wait, okay, hold on. Eight warlords, nine warlords, ten, eleven. It's eleven warlords. I've yet to make a video about all eleven warlords, okay? Um, it was actually, I, I've made separate videos about each of them, and those were actually, like, the first videos I made about One Piece on the channel, like, going all the way back to the far-off year of 2016! It's so weird that I've been talking about One Piece on the channel longer than I talked about Bleach on the channel. That always kind of bugs me. So, I made a, a separate series about that. I made a video called History of the Seven Warlords, but that was more about, well, the history of the organization, and even that video was like six years ago. So I think it's time that we sit down and talk about the Seven Warlords of the Sea. The Seven Warlords. Hey, look, that's just marketing, okay? Eight Warlords of the Sea, ten Warlords of the Sea, twenty-seven Warlords of the Sea. That just doesn't sound as cool. It's seven, alright? There you go, right? Um, so we're gonna go into pretty much everything about it today. We're gonna talk a little bit about the organization itself, then we're going to go into all of the members of the Warlords. Um, we're not really going to be focusing too much on what they do in the plot of the story. We're mainly going to be focusing on how they became Warlords, if we know, how long ago was it, what did they do when they were Warlords, why did the government want them to be Warlords, um, how did they get their status revoked, and that's another reason why I'm doing this right now, because the Warlord system, spoiler for recent One Piece, because we are going to be spoiling stuff up until, like, the Egghead arc. So, just letting you know about that in advance. Um, but there's no longer a warlord system. It was completely abolished in favor of the SSG. So, you know, we're not going to be getting any more warlords in the story. I mean, I guess it's possible that after the events of the story, maybe after Dragon's Revolution and the Tenerubito are abolished, maybe they'll be like, let's bring back the Tenerubito. Not the Tenerubito. No, no, no. We just got rid of the Tenerubito. Let's not bring back the Tenerubito. Let's bring back the, the Shichibukai. Let's bring back the royal Shichibukai. Why not, right? Okay, I, I highly doubt that's the case. I think they're just gone as an organization forever. But they certainly left their mark on the history of One Piece. And yeah, actually, let's start with that very briefly, just from like a meta perspective, like a fan base perspective, not like the actual canon of the manga, the mark that the Seven Warlords left on us, the fans, the readers of One Piece, okay? Because it's a shonen manga, keep in mind, so of course you have to have a group at some point that has a number in their name that the main cast have to face off against. The Seven Warlords of the Sea. The Nine Demon Gates. The Six Prayers. Fairy Tale does this a lot. The the Twenty Moon Rabbits or whatever, you know what I mean? There has to be a group somewhere that's like, oh, they're really powerful. And then one shows up and it's like super powerful and it's like, oh no, we have to fight like seven more of these guys? What's going on, right? So, uh, you know, let's start with that, okay? Um, when the Warlords were introduced as a concept, that was like the first major hurdle that I don't know, because I wasn't reading One Piece, like, weekly back then. You know, this is really early on, right before the group even gets to the Grand Line. But maybe the implication was, like, once you get to the Grand Line, the Straw Hats were going to be facing off against the Warlords, like, one after another. I could kind of see that. I also remember Oda and like, a illustrated, like, uh, like, a color walk book drew concept art for some of the Warlords, like Boa Hancock, like, well back at the beginning of the Grand Line, okay? So maybe people were thinking, like, you're going to go to the Grand Line, face off against one of the warlords, which did end up happening. It was Crocodile. But then maybe after Crocodile, like, next next warlord up and then the one after that. Oda did a pretty good job of spacing them out. Um, and I think that's a good way to do it, because like, in Fairy Tale, for example, when uh, the Fairy Tale Guild goes up against, like, you know, the, the Demon Gates or the Nine Kin of Purgatory or whatever they were all called, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, when they do that, they kind of just defeat that organization or some of them become allies, and then it's just like, that's it, we kind of just move on. Um, you know, to the next group, at least with the Seven Warlords, it was like, okay, the Straw Hats are not going to have to defeat every single one of the Warlords. They're going to have to fight a few. Some of them might become their allies, like with Boa. Some of them might become kind of indifferent, and some of them might not even be involved with the Straw Hats, okay? So I kind of like that about the story. And then other groups were added later on, but it doesn't seem all rushed or like, it, it doesn't seem like Oda was scrambling. That's basically what I'm saying. It doesn't mean like, okay, the Seven Warlords have run their course. I'm gonna throw in the Emperors. Okay, the Emperors have run their
their course. Now I'm throwing in the supernovas. All right, uh, supernovas are running their course. I'm throwing in another group, but it's just like, whatever. Okay, Oda seems to space these out pretty well. And in the case with the supernovas, he didn't even plan those. So yeah, I think the warlords, though, are probably the most iconic in One Piece because they've been around the longest, um, you know. And I, I did a poll on my Twitter to determine who was going to be the character in the thumbnail for this video, you know, big video on the warlords. I decided just to put one of them on the thumbnail. And to nobody's surprise, Dracul Mihawk won. So I think we'll just start with him, okay? Um, so Dracul Mihawk, right? First person to be revealed as a member of the Warlords and mentioned to be one. I think actually the Warlords as an organization was not revealed until after Mihawk first showed up uh, at the Baratier. Also, kind of Oda showing us off like how big the world can really be relatively early on. We got Shanks in the first chapter and we were, you know, shown that Shanks was pretty badass. But no, it's like, okay, we need somebody to really demonstrate the level of power that you can really... Like, what, what's the ceiling in this universe, right? Is it planet level? Is it universe level. No, it's just Mihawk level, okay? So Mihawk rolls up to Baratier and he's ready to place an order, damn it. <laughs> Slices uh, Don Krieg's uh, tr a ship, the Dreadnought Saber, right in half. Cuts Zoro down with very minimal effort. Um, you know, he takes a little bit of, you know, it's like, okay, you're a swordsman too. You seem to have some, some honor with you. You seem to have some balls, okay? So I'll take you on with my mighty sword, Yoru. But you also get the impression, Mihawk Mihawk could have easily diced up Zoro with that little knife. You know, he didn't need to use Yoru. He kind of respected him as a fellow swordsman, okay? So, uh, Mihawk right now in the story is 43 years old. Now, when did he become a warlord? That's the question, okay? There's a lot of the warlords that we do not know exactly when they became a warlord. And also, along with that, makes you question when the organization even began. And I touch upon this in the History of the Seven Warlords video, but basically, in the OVA 3 3D2Y. There's a character that was introduced called Burndy World. Burndy World was a level 6 impel down prisoner that escaped uh, during the breakout and everything with Blackbeard and all that stuff, uh, except he didn't join Blackbeard. He went off on his own, and uh, he had his old crew from like 30 years ago, okay? So he had been locked up for three decades, and so one of his crew was like, oh yes, the warlords are being mobilized, you know, the royal Shichibukai, and Burndy World is just like, Shichibukai! Who the hell are those guys? I've never heard of them. And uh, his crewmate was just like, oh, that's right. You don't know about them because you were locked up for 30 years. Well, it's an organization. Basically, the government recruits pirates, you know, essentially as privateers, puts them on the government payroll and, you know, has them, de uh, de you know, deliver pirate heads and, you know, they, they take out all the other pirates. That's basically the idea, right? They're essentially government dogs, but make no mistake, their power is true, you know? So... If you think about it that way, and I know you could just say, well, 3D2Y was an OVA, it's not canon, but if you go back and you look at all of the canon flashbacks of One Piece, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, because there's a lot of flashbacks in One Piece, I could be, you know, missing something, but I don't think the term Royal Shichibukai or Warlord is used prior to the death of Gold D. Roger, okay? Uh, like, during Odin's flashback, which focused a lot on Whitebeard and Roger and, you know, how, you know, Odin joined those crews and traveled the Grand Line and reached Laugh Tale and everything like that. I don't think the term Warlord of the Sea is referenced at all. Uh, neither is it referenced even further back, you know, with, like, Brooke's backstory with Yorkie or uh, going back even further with, like, Big Mom's backstory at Elbaf. I don't think that term Warlord is used at all. I don't think it's really started to use until after the death of Roger. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense, okay? That the Warlord organization would have started after the Great Pirate Era started, okay? It makes perfect sense, okay? The world was definitely not in an era of peace, but it wasn't as bad as it was now. I mean, there were really strong pirates, like Rox was, like, you know, well over, like, 40 years ago, and then Rox was defeated at God Valley, and then, of course, Roger was out there in the world causing havoc, you know, Shiki was doing stuff. We can't forget about the all-powerful Wang Zhi! You know, they were all doing stuff out there, right? So, it went on a peaceful era, but when Roger, you know, was up there on the scaffolding, he was about to be executed, and he's the one that, you know, lit that spark of, there's the one piece! Bye, everybody! Yarg! You know, and that really ruined a lot of people's day, okay? Definitely ruined the world government's day. 
So you get the impression that, like, maybe not immediately after Roger was executed, but, like, give it a couple of years with the Great Pirate Era really ramping up all these really powerful pirates. Like, keep this in mind. During Roger's execution, there were four future warlords present in the crowd that day. Actually, you know what? No, there were five. <laughs> there were five. Uh, Crocodile was there. Doflamingo was there. Moria was there. Uh, and, um, oh, there was another one. Wait, Crocodile, Mihawk. Yeah, Mihawk. Mihawk was there. And then Buggy. Buggy was also there. He was just an apprentice at that point. He was just a teenager. But these were five people that were not warlords at that time that, you know, were just started with their pirate journey. Like, Crocodile and Moria went out to sea to become pirates on their own. Uh, Crocodile challenged Whitebeard. Moria ended up challenging Kaido. Uh, uh, Buggy eventually retreated into the east, but he eventually became a warlord. And then Mihawk kind of went off on his own to become the Marine Hunter. And I love that title. Just kind of parallels Zoro as the Pirate Hunter. Before Mihawk became a warlord, he was the Marine Hunter, okay? So, uh, yeah, he was probably just going around the four blues in the Grand Line, challenging really strong Marines and slicing them down. And it probably happened a lot, okay? It happened a lot, all right? To the point where, you know, how like there's uh there's like a national cemetery you know like in our world like arlington national cemetery where it's like you know military personnel are buried and you know like people like that i imagine there's something like that for the marines in one piece where there's just this huge graveyard that's just a memorial to all the marines that have fell in battle over the centuries and there's just a whole section that's the mihawk section okay and really it comes down to it of like you know that old strategy of hey can't beat them join him or you know if we can't beat him he keeps hacking apart marines left and right um how about we let him join us all right so i like to think mihawk was one of the first warlords that were recruited when the system came to be okay so just a little bit of my head cannon on how this actually went down so you got to think about okay the reverie which was just held in one piece right the Reverie, this one, with uh, King Riku Dold III and uh, Nefeltari Cobra, kind of spoke about the Warlord system and how it was corrupted and how it should be abolished. And it was at that Reverie. So I'm thinking, okay, if it required a Reverie Summit to abolish the Warlord system, that makes me think that a Reverie Summit probably was responsible for creating the Warlord system. Like, at one Reverie Summit, one year, they decided, like, okay, this great pirate era, is too much it cannot be contained there are pirates everywhere causing havoc we need to do something we need action we need to figure out some way to combat these pirates the emperors in the new world they're causing chaos you know like the marines are not enough we need something more maybe somebody some random king threw out the idea of like well what if we uh what if we pay them off what if we select a certain amount of really strong pirates pay them off put them on the government payroll, give them a bunch of, like, cushy benefits and everything like that, and then um, they work for us, and then we have them eliminate the other pirates. And I'm like, oh, man, that's really messed up, the world government and the Marines working alongside pirates. He's like, well, what else do you, what other ideas do you got, man? And it's just like, okay, well, how many do you think we should hire? It's like, well, I don't know, man, like, five? No, five, that doesn't sound enough. Ten? Oh, God, no, we don't want ten pirates working for the government. How about seven? That's a happy medium. I was going to say eight. Shut up. Okay, we're doing seven. Seven warlords of the sea, all right? So I'm thinking a reverie summit was the cause of this. Then you start looking back in the timeline. This is hilarious, okay? So the most the reverie is held every four years. The summit's held every four years at Marijoie, okay? There was just one in the year of right now in the One Piece story, in the present, 24 years after Roger's execution. Now, I suck at math, but last time I checked, 24 is divisible by 4, which means six reverie summits ago, the same year that the King of the Pirates, Goldie Roger, was executed, there was a reverie summit. And I would love to know if that reverie summit was before or after Roger was executed at Logtown. Because they would, go, they would go very different ways, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, I don't think 
the warlord system began on uh, during that reverie when Roger was just executed. Because even if it was after Roger was executed, the Great Pirate Era was still just maybe like a spark or a twinkle in Roger's eye. You know, it was just like if the reverie was held after it, maybe the 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 discussion would have involved like, all right, the King of the Pirates is dead, but he told everybody the One Piece is real, is that going to be a problem? Uh, it's, no, 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 it, it probably won't be, not a big deal, I mean, he's dead now, it's, it's fine, it's fine, it's no big deal. You sure, there, there's like, reported, uh, there, there's a little bit more pirate activity in certain areas, nah, 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 that'll, send out the marines, that'll quell it pretty quick, we just gotta, you know, you know, put it down on them, they'll, they'll lose their spirit eventually. Cut to four years later at the next reverie, so 20 years ago. You're like, damn it! Roger, you son of a bitch! <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's where it started, okay? Here's some other believability for that, okay? We'll get to that when we get to the next Warlord. We're still technically talking about Mihawk. But um, Mihawk was not a Warlord at Roger's execution. This was 24 years ago. Uh, Mihawk would have been 19 at the time. But I think very shortly after that he became a warlord, and I think he was one of the first ones, because when you're going to make a group of really strong pirates to fight the other pirates, you want to make sure that the person working for you is strong enough to get the job done. Well, who do you think they're going to suggest? You know, if that reverie did happen, it's like, all right, I guess we're doing this, this royal sh uh, warlord plan. Maybe it wasn't seven at first. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe they actually started building one at a time, because it's a little weird for them to decide on seven right out of the gate. You know what I mean? M maybe it was just like, all right, let's recruit, like, one pirate as a privateer, as one of these warlords, and see where that goes. And they recruited Mihawk first, and they're like, okay, he seems to be getting the job done as we, while he's working for us, so let's recruit another, and then let's recruit another. And maybe when they got to seven, they were like, okay, this is good, this is all right, we no, no more of this, because if you get too many, then that starts to tip the balance, and that's the whole point, is the Shichibukai are one of the three great balances of power. You got the Marines, you got the Warlords, and you got the Yonko, okay? So you want to try to balance all three of them, you don't want to get one too strong, because maybe if the warlords get too powerful then it's just like okay then we're basically having another group of yonko on our hands and let's not do that you know what i mean so yeah i think he was the first because he was the marine hunter so they're like let's take care of that problem right now and mihawk is in general very amenable to things you know what i mean he's he's the only member of the warlords that uh well no not the only one because weevil as well but um he doesn't have a pirate crew he doesn't have a group of people that he's going around pillaging with he's just interested in being the strongest swordsman in the world and he goes around and challenges anybody that would dare to try to bring him in or is also a swordsman right so they were probably like okay miyak how about you join us we'll pay you you can have whatever island you want we don't care um all you got to do is just listen to us when we summon you and also defeat some pirates okay just please stop killing marines and mihawk is like this is acceptable drinking his wine i also require some of the finest wine also give me a really badass coffin boat all right, fine. You want a coffin boat? Sure, we'll give you a coffin boat. Here you go. <laughs> all right, yeah. So I don't think Mihawk is like, all right, I get to now travel the world. I get to challenge really strong swordsmen that aren't Marines. Um, and I don't have to worry about the Marines constantly trying to bring me in, which was probably a little bit of an annoyance for Mihawk anyway. So it's like, okay, fine. I'll join you, right? So uh, Mihawk maintained this title for probably the entirety of like, like 20 plus years up until the system was abolished. Um, honestly, Mihawk was probably the most model warlord you could really hope for in the world government and it also makes sense if he was the first one they recruited they'd be like okay Mihawk's not really causing that much problems like you don't see Mihawk out there forming his own criminal organization like you know Crocodile Forum Baroque Works or Doflamingo's overthrowing Dressrosa Mihawk's not into that kind of stuff he's just interested in sword fighting and when he's not sword fighting chilling out in his awesome Dracula castle drinking some wine you know what I mean that's all he's into okay he's kind of a model warlord and it still is kind of like a dick thing that the government's like all right revoke all of the warlords send the marines bring me hawk in and it is like are, are you sure are you sure you want to do that you know what this guy's former title was, right? There's still some Marines, I bet, that are, like, old enough to remember uh, Marine Hunter Mihawk's days, you know? And I bet, like, as soon as, like, the title was revoked, they woke up in a cold sweat, waiting, like, expecting Mihawk to be in the door and just being like, hey, no longer a warlord. 
time to pick up where I left off. You know what I mean? It's like, ah! You know, it's like, so that, not a great idea there, but hey, whatever, it, it happened, okay? Also, that leads to Mihawk's current bounty being 3590000000 They gave this dude a bounty that is higher than not one, but two of the current emperors. Higher than Luffy's, which isn't that big of a deal, but higher than Buggy's, ladies and gentlemen, all right? Mihawk literally has a Yonko-level bounty, and he's not a Yonko. He's a Mihawk. It's like a separate category. It's like Warlord, Yonko, Mihawk class, and only one man fits that bill, all right? So that's just, I think, because of his Marine Hunter credentials is why they gave him a bounty that damn high, okay? Also makes you wonder, like, couldn't they have just abolished the Warlord system but, like, kept Mihawk on? I'm just like, all right, look, here's the deal. We're gonna abolish the Warlords, all right? You know, Crocodile abused the title, Doflamingo abused the title, um, you know, Law abused the title, he also went rogue, you know, there's a lot, Morio was too weak, you know, so you know what, we're just, we're just, you know, finishing off the whole thing, we're not doing it anymore, we're scrapping the whole procedure. Mihawk, though, tell you what, if you agree to still work for us, we'll still give you all the benefits that we had as a warlord. Technically, you won't be a warlord anymore, but we'll come up with a really cool title for you or something. We'll make sure you're taken care of, okay? You think they would have done something like that, but no, they completely flipped the script and they're just like, no, Mihawk, we're bringing you in! I'm like, you sure about that? You really sure about that? All right, cool. So uh, right now he is, of course, working uh, in the Cross Guild under the mentorship of Buggy the Clown. So uh, he'll probably even get stronger. Like if Buggy trains Mihawk, I, I think that <laughs> I think he'll reach even higher levels of power. Also. I, as a last little bit of a note on Mihawk here, and I've made a lot of videos on Mihawk, even there's a, a holiday dedicated to Mihawk, it's Mihawk Day, it's October 14th, you didn't know that? Well, it's a holiday, of course, but I just wanted to say that out of the original seven, okay, so we're talking about the original seven, so we're not including Blackbeard, we're not including uh, Weevil or Law in this group, or, or Blackbeard, yeah, so... I would say Mihawk is probably the strongest. I'm not getting into a whole power scaling, crossover battle kind of situation here, you know, but I would say out of the original seven, Mihawk is easily far and above the absolute strongest out of all of them and could probably defeat each of the warlords like if now if they had like a battle royale kind of situation where they were all fighting at once um and maybe it's like absolute chaos and like some warlords team up against other warlords and then that's like another thing altogether but you know if it's a one-on-one -on -one fight just mihawk against doflamingo i think mihawk would win mihawk against uh you know um uh, Crocodile, I think Mihawk would eventually win. Mihawk against Jinbei, that would be a tough fight, I'm sure. But I'm thinking Mihawk would come out ahead of the game. And I think he was the strongest of the original seven. And I think that's also why Oda started with him. To kind of show us just how powerful you could really get in this story, okay? But anyway, I'm like 20-something minutes into the video. And I've only talked about one Warlord. we got ten more to discuss. So we should get this moving. I should also mention at this point that um, I'm going in the order that they were fully introduced as warlords in the manga okay that's the order we're going about it here so we'll get to that more when we when you see but the next one is pretty simple actually because the next one that was mentioned after mihawk was jinbei it was actually mentioned by yosaku but we actually didn't end up seeing jinbei for another 500 chapters he was the second one of them to be mentioned but the last of the original seven to be revealed in fact blackbeard was revealed as technically the eighth member of the warlords before Jinbei was properly introduced as the seventh member of the original Warlords, okay? We have, um, we have Crocodile, Sir Crocodile. He's currently 46 years old. He's the user of the Suna Suna no Mi, and he was made a member of the Seven Warlords in his mid-twenties. This was something that was actually confirmed by Oda himself in an SBS uh, during the flashback with uh, Corazon and Law. Corazon was reading a newspaper article that had Crocodile in it, and somebody questioned Oda about that, and Oda's like, basically giving us a little bit of backstory on uh, Crocodile here. And he's like, yeah, so Crocodile was present during the execution of Roger. He was really motivated. He went out to sea to become a pirate. He wanted to be king of the pirates, just like Luffy, just like a lot of other pirates at the time. He fought against Whitebeard. He lost. Um, this is headcanon for me, but I think that's where he lost a hand. I think Whitebeard ripped off his hand or sliced it or somebody like Vista cut it off or something like that. I think that's where that happened. Um, and Oda clarifies that it was shortly after that encounter when Crocodile was somewhere in his 
mid-20s. He doesn't specify the exact age. He just says mid-20s. That's when Crocodile became a member of the Seven Warlords, okay? So Crocodile's 46 right now, which means 20 years ago, he would have been 26, which is right around in his mid-20s. So once again, that kind of follows the logic that I'm thinking here, where 24 years ago, Roger was executed, kickstarts the Great Pirate Era. Then... Four years go by after the reverie from when he was executed. The next reverie occurs 20 years ago. That's when everybody really understands that this pirate era is not going away. It's just, it's just not going to be quelled. These pirates are getting more and more powerful and ambitious by the day. They're all going crazy looking for the One Piece. We need some kind of countermeasure. And it was at that reverie summit 20 years ago that the warlord system was properly established. Okay, maybe it wasn't seven warlords, but it's like we need to, we need to start recruiting pirates to see strong pirates that can maybe help us. So the first person was Mihawk because he was already established as the Marine Hunter. Then the next person they recruited right around the same time was Crocodile because it's like, okay, Crocodile's an up-and-coming pirate. He did fight Whitebeard. He lost, but we don't know exactly how that fight went. You know, maybe Whitebeard was, uh, maybe himself was not damaged at all, but maybe Crocodile was able to take out maybe a maybe a chunk of Whitebeard's force. Maybe Crocodile sunk one of Whitebeard's ships or something like that. Keep in mind, too, this was like when Crocodile was relatively new to the scene and everything like that. So what if they's like, all right, he just got defeated by Whitebeard, but he challenged him, and he seemed to maybe get pretty far into the new world. So how about we recruit this Crocodile guy to be a warlord? So... I think as as far as the continuity is concerned, as like the timeline of all this, when Crocodile was in his mid-20s, which would have been around 20 years ago, that was the first canonical reference to the Warlord system existing. I don't think there's any references to it further back than around 20 years ago. Like I said, Oda did not give us an exact date, so 20 years ago, it could have been 21 years ago when he was 25, it could have been 22 years ago when he was 24, like all of those, like 24 to 26 kind of constitutes your, your mid-20s, you know? So somewhere around in that ballpark, though. But considering 20 years ago lines up with a reverie meeting, I, I would assume that would make the most sense, okay? So, Crocodile, after being defeated by Whitebeard, not one to rest on his laurels, he decided, okay, I am now a member of this organization that works for the government. So, I have some resources to work with here, all right? So, I think for a little while there, Crocodile played by the rules. And he worked as, you know, just the savior of uh, maybe Alabasta. He, he was in Alabasta 30, uh, not when he was 30, when he was 30. So, this would have been uh, 16 years ago, because that's what the article in the paper was about. When Corazon was reading and you saw the little picture of Crocodile, that was an article talking about how Crocodile was the savior of Alabasta, defeating pirates that attacked, like, Nanohana and stuff. So 16 years ago, when he was 30, he was already set up in Alabasta, he was already interested in Pluton, already building up a reputation, and probably beginning to build Baroque works at that moment. So that still gives us a couple of years to play with here, from his mid-20s, when he became a warlord, to when he was in Alabasta at age 30. So I think for those first few years, he just kind of, you know, stayed low. You know, he worked his job as a warlord, and he worked it well to gain some reputation, to get the government on his side to kind of trust him, like, okay, we can trust Crocodile, he's not doing anything too nefarious, uh, you know, we can focus on other stuff, okay? And then that's when Crocodile made his move. He started, because it, it really seems like the Warlords are not really supervised all that much, you know, they don't really send, like, a government official to, like, like a, a cipher pole agent to go and be like, okay, Crocodile, um, hello there, I'm your yearly correspondent for being a Warlord, uh, could you please give us um, a quota of how many pirates you defeated this past year? It, it's like doing the taxes for the Shishibu guy. It is like, mm, you defeated, okay, now you have a quota. You have to defeat at least 200 pirates uh, per year. Uh, you only defeated 197 this year, so keep that in mind. That's going to come out of your pay. You know, it might, you know, it wasn't anything like that. It wasn't. They were not really supervising Crocodile at all. You think they would have sent, like, a Cyperpole 7 agent or something to do it, but, you know, they just, I don't know. So, then again, I mean, Crocodile, I mean, was he really being that overt with running the secret clandestine organization? I don't know, um, but because it was it was well known, I think that Baroque Works was 
headquartered in Alabasta? Like, didn't it wasn't that common knowledge that like all of these secret agents, like Mister One, Mister Two, were like based in Alabasta? Coincidentally, it's the same place that Crocodile has set up his you know, his uh, casino, and he's a warlord there. I don't know. It feels like some one of the cipher pool agencies, one of the intelligence operatives of the government, should have been able to connect the dots on this one. I I don't know. Anyway, so uh, he was building up Baroque Works underground while masquerading as a warlord. Not masquerading. I mean, he was doing his job. He did stop pirate crews from attacking the island. He was seen as a hero to many people, okay? And so um, he built up Baroque Works. He got some pretty strong people together in terms of the officer agents like Mr. One Daz Bones, Zala, who's Miss Doublefinger, um, Mr. Two Bonclé, you know, you had Galdino, which, all right, you're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel now, but whatever, it's okay. You got Babe, you got Drophy, Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas, you got Mr. Five, Jem, and you got uh, uh, Makita, who was Miss Valentine. So you got some strong officer agents, but then going into the frontier agents and then eventually the millions and the billions, I mean, they really weren't that powerful. He was definitely focusing a lot more on uh, quantity at that point, just building up this huge organization. And his remember, his ultimate goal was Project Utopia, to find Pluton and then take control of that. And after Crocodile retrieved Pluton, I'm pretty sure he would just disregard most of Baroque Works. Like, he didn't really need the, the foot soldiers anymore once he has the world and island destroying super battleship, you know what I mean? Well, anyway, as we all know, he was found out, uh, you know, VV learned about him, infiltrated Baroque Works, and then VV joined the Straw Hats, and then they all went up against Baroque Works at Alabasta, and then Luffy punched out Crocodile, just BAM! BAM! One more time, BAM! You know, okay. And uh, by the way, the ending of that was beautiful. I think they used, one of the few cases of them actually using, like, an actual musical score, um, like something that existed prior to One Piece, like an or orchestral score that wasn't created for One Piece, they play Ave Maria when here look dies. Um, that was a really beautiful scene. And I, I don't know if it was the, was it the 1812 overture? It was something like that when he's like, dun, 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 You know, that was like the song that plays when Luffy gummo gummo no storms beats the shit out of Crocodile. Literally punches him through like several hundred feet of rock and stone and dirt. And then boom, knocks him through the freaking uh, floor, the, the ground of Alubarn. And he's like, ah, you know, I mean, so that's where he was defeated and then carted off to level six of Impel Down, but eventually was freed, coincidentally, also by Luffy. Weird how things work. It's almost like this entire universe was created by a, a single author. It's crazy, right? So Crocodile, of course, breaks out of Impel Down, goes to Marine Ford, fights there. Um, you know, he clashes with Whitebeard very briefly. Luffy kind of stops him. So it, you see how that would have went. I don't think that rematch would have went really well on Crocodile anyway. Crocodile, though, I mean... He definitely has moments where he's very brash and he just goes forward without thinking first. Not as bad as Blackbeard does, but he does have those moments. Uh, he lets his rage and, like, you know, he's like, oh, this is Whitebeard. I'm going to take him down this time without actually thinking about, like, maybe you shouldn't. Um, but, you know, when he sits down and calms down and kind of focuses on a plan, it's like, all right, I'm going to be very methodical about this, okay? I tried to be a regular pirate and go after the One Piece. That didn't work out too well. So now I'm going to start a secret organization. All right, that that didn't work out too well. All right, we're going to do this again, but a little different this time. Now I'm going to recruit Mihawk, and then we're going to work with Buggy. We're going to get money from him that I loaned him, and then we're going to make another organization that's a little bit stronger, okay? Now, that didn't work out exactly the way Crocodile planned with the Cross Guild, but eh, close enough. You know what I mean? They're causing chaos in the world with bounties on marine heads and everything like that. You got Mihawk with you. You know, Buggy does... He is useful. He does have resources and everything like that, right? So, absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the situation with Crocodile right now. His bounty is 1965000000 so not on the level of, like, um, you know, uh, Mihawk or anything, or an emperor, but well, keep in mind, Luffy was considered the fifth emperor with a bounty of $1.5 and Crocodile has just shy of $2 billion, so pretty damn close. His bounty is higher than any other um, Yonko commander, like higher than Marcos, higher than Kings, higher than Queens or Katakuris or anybody like that. So he, he certainly is is there at that level, okay, of the threat that the government is aware that he's capable of, okay? So, with that being said now, uh, moving on to the next warlord, so right after Alabaster, right after Crocodile was defeated, we are introduced to two more warlords, one of which being Don Quixote do Flamingo, and oh my god, where do you even start with this guy? So... 
If Crocodile was maybe the most scheming out of all of the Warlords, and if Mihawk was maybe the physically strongest out of all of the original Warlords, easily Doflamingo was the most evil. Not even the most evil out of all of the Warlords, because a lot of the original Warlords are not really evil. I would not consider Mihawk evil. I would not consider Jinbei or Boa evil. Although she does kick puppies. That is pretty evil. Uh, that's, a, that's a thing with Boa. Like, you gotta think about... We'll get to her in a moment. But it's like, you gotta think about Boa. And it's like, okay. But then it's like, ah, oh, man. She kicks puppies and, like, baby seals on the regular. <sighs> All right, but anyway, uh, maybe that's, you know, skirting a line there. But, uh, you know, I, I would not consider uh, Bartholomew Kuma evil. You know, he got turned into a robot. He kind of doesn't have a personality anymore. Uh, even Moria. Was Moria really all that evil? I mean, Moria really spent most of his time just chilling out on an island, raising an army of zombies from the corpses of people. Okay, he was pretty evil. But Doflamingo takes the evil cake. Evil! He, he takes the evil cake for sure, okay? Doflamingo's out there running human auction houses and slave rings, and he's got freaking uh, a, a girl on his crew that has an ability that turns people into toys and makes all of their loved ones forget about them, trapping them in a, in a, in a, 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 a body that can't feel anything and then just, like, forced to do their will. I mean, like, Doflamingo is a horrible human being. He has no empathy or guilt or remorse for any of it shot his own father in the face, shot his own brother in the face, does not care. This is a cold-blooded killer of the highest caliber, okay? Uh, now, the way that he became Warlord, a little bit different. He actually became Warlord, I think, out of the original seven. He was the most recent. He became a Warlord officially 10 years ago. He's 41 right now. He became a Warlord when he was 31, okay? So... The way he became Warlord, though, was a little different because usually it's like you have to, like, send in an... I, I guess you can send in an application, I guess, kind of, but it's mostly just, like, if there's an opening or a vacancy, the government will seek somebody out. Uh, I guess you could send in an application because Lafitte did. Lafitte kind of arrived and just like, ah, well, you know, Crocodile is defeated. Well, have you considered Blackbeard? You know, something like that, right? So um, the case with Doflamingo, though, he's already a Celestial Dragon, or he was at one point. He got revoked because his father father left, but he still knows a lot of stuff about Marijois and the inner workings of that place, and he also, I think, ransomed a bunch of ships that were uh, taking the heavenly tribute to the Teneribito, like Doflamingo was aware of where these ships were, and so he captured them and was like, hey, you can have your heavenly tribute, Teneribito, but I want to be a warlord, and so then they're like... All right, fine, you're a warlord. So that was an instance where the government was forced to make Doflamingo a warlord. Left to their own devices, they would probably not have allowed him to do that, but he's got, like, insider knowledge, information that Tenrabito do not want to get out. So he's like, all right... He's kind of twisting our arm on this, but we can make him one, all right? It was also how, with Law's plan of how, like, you know, I want you to, uh, you know, resign from the Warlords and everything like that. And so he did, but they created that fake report. The only way that that would have been feasible was because he had connections with the Celestial Dragons, you know what I mean? So that's how he became a Warlord. Uh, he took over the island of Dressrosa, deposed the king, King Riku Dold the Third, in the most horrible way possible by basically forcing him to slaughter his own subjects, setting himself up as like, oh yes, the ruler of Dressrosa, the Do the the you know the Don Quixote family has returned after you know 900 years. We're back, and I'm saving you from your king, who up until yesterday was a perfectly kind, benevolent man, but all of a sudden started slaughtering all of his uh, subjects in one night. It's a good thing I was just passing by with my crew of really badass pirates. I'll just defeat all of uh, the king's men, and then boom, I'll establish myself as the king of Dressrosa, and everybody will love me. By the way, there's a bunch of toys walking around now. Don't question it. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Doflamingo, it's, it's, yeah, he had a lot of influence over the people there. Very charismatic evil, which is like the worst kind of evil, honestly, in manga and also in our world. Um, so he had a bounty of 340 million. Uh, that was obviously frozen when he became a warlord 10 years ago. He had a really prominent pirate crew that was active all up and down the North Blue and everything like that. Um, eventually reached the Grand Line. I, th I think the events of Dressrosa all occurred... Uh, before he was officially made a warlord. I, I, I think that occurred, like, uh, what was this? I think, 
wait a second. This was after... Okay, no, no, wait. Because there's a lot of stuff with Doflamingo's flashbacks. We get a lot of them, okay? When Law first showed up to Doflamingo's crew, Law was like 10. And then we do a little bit of a flash forward. That's when everything with Corazon happened. When Corazon died and Law ate the op op fruit and then ran off. And then it was further... It might have been the same year. It might have been like 10 years ago is when Doflamingo took over Dressrosa and when Doflamingo became a warlord because Law was not with them at that point. Sugar was there and Law had did not know about Sugar. They never met. So that wasn't until after Law left. So yeah, it might have been like 11 or 10 years ago, but I think it was 10 years ago that he did both of these. It was like his master plan kind of coming to fruition there, okay? So, um, you know, he was there and then the whole fall of, you know, his status really did happen though even though it was like a fake at first when he like you know bent the news and everything to make it look like he had resigned but he really didn't um you know cypher pole zero and everything got involved but he eventually was defeated by luffy at dress rosa and then unlike what happened with crocodile where the marines kind of covered it up and it's like oh no uh smoker's the one that defeated crocodile no it was fujitora Admiral who was present that actually bowed down before all of the citizens of Dressrosa and all of the Den Den Mushi were on him and so the whole world kind of got to see this him bowing down and admitting that the Marines failed and it was Luffy that was the one that actually properly defeated Doflamingo, okay? That was something that the Marines could not cover up and they were a little pissed about that because at a certain point when the Warlords reached their apex the idea of one of them failing was an issue. So that's why they tried to replace, you know, Crocodile with Blackbeard as quickly as possible. They needed to find some replacement. But then after Moria was defeated by Luffy, shortly after Crocodile was defeated, the government was kind of freaking out. Like, we can't, like keep having warlords falling left and right that kind of defeats the whole purpose the world's going to start thinking yeah so what i think the situation with the seven is Mihawk, Crocodile were first, and the others were joining up later. Uh, Kuma joined about, like, well, we don't know exactly when Kuma joined. Moria joined, I think, a little bit after that as well, after the whole events with Kaido, after his crew died and everything, he, he joined. Uh, Boa joined, we do know, 13 years ago. Jinbei joined 11 years ago, and Doflamingo joined uh, 10 years ago, okay? So I like to think, for the last decade, the Warlords existed as they existed at the start of the story. With Mihawk, Crocodile, Doflamingo, Kuma, Moria, Hancock, and Jinbei. Alright, that's the seven. And for ten years, ever since Doflamingo joined, it might have been the six warlords before Doflamingo joined ten years ago. But then it was the seven. And that was kind of when they hit the sweet spot. That was like the seven warlords. That's when everybody started calling them that. Because they were this undefeated force. None of them failed. None of them really, you know, were weakened or anything like that. It was just like for 10 solid years, the seven warlords of the sea lived up to their name and their status, okay? It wasn't until that stupid rubber kid from the East Blue showed up and then boom, punched out Crocodile. Boom, punched out Moria. That's when he, they started having a problem. They're like, oh man, we were good for like 10 years. Also, Ace was, um, uh, you know, asked to join at one point. This was a couple years ago. This would have been like, I um, mean, like five years before the start of the story. Um, I think, uh, wait, no, five years ago, he left Fusha. And then, uh, yeah, he might have been recruited maybe four years ago or something like that. But he turned it down. So if Ace would have joined, I guess it might have been the eight warlords. I guess? I don't know. But anyway, yeah, Doflamingo is currently imprisoned in level 6 of Impel Down, but he's uh, keeping up to date with the news. Uh, he's reading the newspapers, so they're nice enough. Uh, they actually, I think, evacuated all of level 6 for that reason, because uh, you know, an assassin from up above from the Holy Land might actually come down to want to um, eliminate him. So, I don't know exactly know where that's going to pan out, or who the assassin is, or maybe he might get freed and then go out in the world. I think Doflamingo has to show up again at some point during this final war where things get really hectic, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's he, his story is not over yet. We'll be seeing Doflamingo again, certainly. Uh, probably going to be tying back into Eam and some stuff involving the Celestial Dragons. Like, I think if Doflamingo gets out, he's just going to spill the beans to the whole world at this point. He doesn't care. You know, he I think he has a he, he realizes the era is ending. The world is going to be tossed into upheaval anyway. So I think Doflamingo might actually play a strange role in actually bringing down the Tenryu B 
Ruby-Veto system because he'll just announce to the whole world what the tender veto really are and then Eam exists and everything and the whole world is just going to be like, what? And then that's going to really be the opening salvos for the, the end of the tender veto system. You know, Dragon's Revolution will carry most of the weight there, but Doflamingo, I think, does have a role to play. Absolutely. You know, I knew this was going to be a long video at the start. I was kind of looking at the list, and I'm like, man, I got to talk about 11 characters today. I've been doing this for 45 minutes. I'm only three characters in. So that's just how it goes. All right. Moving on to our next warlord. This guy was also introduced alongside Doflamingo at a little bit of a, not the reverie, but like at a meeting of the warlords and the marines after Crocodile was defeated at Marijois. We have Bartholomew Kuma with a former bounty of 296 million berries. All right. So... Kuma is probably the most mysterious member ooh, of the original seven, okay? In that we're still learning stuff about his past. In fact, right now in Egghead, uh, we're beginning to unravel exactly what his life was like. We know he was a slave when he was a child. We know he eventually became the ruler of the Sorbet Kingdom in the south, so tell me how that works. Then we know that he was a member of the Revolutionary Army. You tell me how that works. Then uh, he had a daughter in there somewhere too, who is Jory Bonnie. Um, you know, I do know how that works. You don't have to. You don't have to explain that to me. But then he uh, then joined the government and get turned into a mindless death terminator. You tell me how that works. You know, I, I don't know. Okay, we're, we're still learning stuff about Kuma, um, but he was known as the tyrant. Okay, so I think this is holdover from his time as a king although Bonnie said that Kuma was never a, ty a tyrant you know he was a nice man he was a good guy so this is probably just more of the just a propaganda from the government's perspective probably whenever Kuma decided to turn traitor and join the revolutionary army because he's one of the founding members alongside Ivankov and Dragon so probably when that happened the government probably started spinning a line of like oh yes Bartholomew Kuma the king of the Storbay kingdom he was a brutal tyrant that killed all of his uh, subjects you know when in reality it could have been the government's setting him up. It could have been the cypher pole that went in and like massacred the entire island and then blamed it on Kuma. Something similar that Doflamingo did with King Riku, you know? Something very similar to that, okay? Now, the events of the Grey Terminal were 12 years ago, and he was still working for the revolutionaries, and I don't think he was a cyborg yet at that point. So that means, um, if we're assuming that he had to join, like, immediately after that, then he could not have been a warlord until, you know, it had to have been the maximum of 12 years ago, okay? Probably a little bit, you know, more recent than that, maybe 11 years ago or something like that, but about 12 years ago is when he became a warlord. Um, it, it, it's, it's weird, it really is, because it's almost like... It's almost like the government wanted him to join to become a warlord only if he was modified into a cyborg. But number one, why would Kuma agree to that? And number two, even if he did agree to that, why would the government, like, you know, just believe him? You know what I mean? Like, Bartholomew Kuma you to join the warlords even though you're a member of the revolutionary army like how would that even work you know it's one thing to make a pirate a member of the warlords you know like like and, and like mihawk wasn't even a pirate really mihawk was just a swordsman going around the world just cutting people up okay? uh speaking mihawk was more of a serial killer than a pirate but anyway um he's like oh you're, you're just like you're you're a one person by yourself you're not part of any larger group join the warlords okay fine that makes sense doflamingo used blackmail okay but then you get to cool a pirate he's a revolutionary army for god's sake so why would the government reach out and be like we want you to join or unless maybe Kuma was feeding information to the government, so maybe the government thought that Kuma was like a mole for the revolutionaries. Now, obviously, he wouldn't have been. He would have been like a double agent. So it was probably part of Vegapunk and Dragon's idea to like set Kuma up as a traitor for us, and then maybe have a big moment where Kuma betrays the revolutionaries, and all the other revolutionaries are like, Kuma, why would you do that? And then he left. And then, boom, got turned into a cyborg. Just to, Maybe that was the government like, okay, yes, the traitor Bartholomew Kuma, we'll make him a warlord. But Vegapunk, 
we want to make sure he doesn't double cross us, turn him into a cyborg at once. Not knowing that Vegapunk was also probably working with Dragon, and it is like, you know, it was all part of this plan altogether. Like, Dragon was thinking like seven steps ahead. Okay, something like that, right? So, Kuma got turned into a pacifista, and from what we understand as of right now, his physical body that has the power of the pawpaw fruit that can send people flying, that ability and that body is really mindless. It, it really is just living on the instructions and the code or whatever that Vegapunk programmed it into, the protocol to like whatever. So currently he's actually climbing the red line at the red port. He seems very dedicated to reach the top of the red line. He's being shot at by a bunch of Marines, so we don't know if he'll make it or not. It's very reminiscent of the time the Iron Giant attacked Marie's Wa 200 years ago, so there's a parallel to that definitely. Um, and this is all probably because of some program, some uh, protocol that Vegapunk, you know, put inside of Kuma's brain. Meanwhile, Kuma's actual brain, his well, his memories anyway, he rejected it using his pawpaw fruit, created a memory bubble that Bonnie is now inside of, and she's reliving all of Kuma's memories and learning about the kind of person that he was. Okay, so we're still in the process of learning a lot about Kuma, but his story is one of the more fascinating ones in all of One Piece right now, and I made a whole video talking about the life of Bartholomew Kuma from what we know so far, so go and check out that video. But yeah, right now, his actual physical body, I, I don't even know if it has a bounty. I put a question mark here because I'm just like... You know, technically speaking, I guess the Warlord system was revoked, so he does have a bounty, but as far as the government is concerned, he's a robot, but also now he's a rogue robot, because he's off on his own, not being commanded any by anybody, and uh, so I, I guess he still has an active bounty of uh, probably higher than $296 million at this point. Uh, we'll see if he reaches Marijua, though. Uh, you know, I, uh, there I go ahead, Bartholomew Kuma, I wish you the best. Okay, so moving on to the next Warlord, and the next major uh, enemy that the Straw Hats have to face off against in the story at Thriller Bark, we have Gecko Moria, Kishi Shishi, the user of the Kage Kage no Mi. Also, I believe the oldest member of the Warlords at age 50. So he's getting over the hill. We have to have a retirement party for him soon, okay? So, um, oh boy, Moria, Moria, Moria. I've made a lot of videos about Moria. I just talked about him like uh, this week, actually, in a video I made on Perona. So, Moria was also present that fateful day watching the execution of the Pirate King Goldie Roger. And much like Crocodile, he decided to go out to sea. And much like Crocodile, he succeeded. He got a crew together. He's got the Shadow Fruit. Pretty powerful fruit. Uh, he's going up and down. Paradise just dominating. Then they go into the New World dominating, and um, just like Crocodile went up against Whitebeard, Moria also set his sights on one of the Emperors. In this case, it was Kaido at Wano. So he goes to Wano, big epic battle between Kaido and Moria, and unfortunately, Moria's entire crew is massacred. It is implied he is the only one that managed to get out alive. Uh, not empty-handed. He did manage to escape with the body of the sword god Ryuma and his prized sword, the uh, Owazumono Shusui. But other than that, his entire crew was just decimated which really left a like a PTSD kind of a you know a, like symptom like for him you know like he was seriously like messed up for the rest of his life by that like literally watching all of his crew massacred right in front of him okay he seems like kind of a callous individual but like these are people he actually cared about okay uh, and so he just he just kind of let himself go, you know what I mean? I, I think it wasn't, um, you know, this was 23 years ago, he clashed with Kaido, so if we're going along with my idea that the Warlord system didn't exist yet until 20 years ago, maybe it took a few years for him to really recuperate, I don't think Moria would have been in the mood to immediately join the Warlords right after all of his crew were just massacred. He, he probably needed a few years to just kind of, like, retreat and just kind of, like, work through some things, you know what I mean? But after a few years, uh, they you know, extended an invitation to him, so he decided to join. Um, I like to think he was the third member that joined, so it was Mihawk first, then Crocodile, then I like to think it was Moria, because uh, we don't know the exact time other than it being after Roger's execution. He was still a pirate during 23 years ago when he fought Kaido, so it would have been after that, right? So that, that's just my headcanon. I'm going with that. Third member. Um... Now, Moria, like Crocodile, you know, there's a lot of parallels here. Crocodile attacked Whitebeard, and he failed and probably lost a hand. So he's like, all right, let's try something different here. Let's not do the exact same thing all over again. So he created Baroque Works. Now, with Moria, different tactic. He was like, okay... My crew was wiped out. I really don't want to live with that again. I really don't want to deal with that stuff again. So... 
I'm going to use the Kage Kage no Mi to create an army of zombies. So he allies with Hogback and Perona and Absalom. He meets all of them, and he decides to, like, okay, we're going to work together as the Mysterious Four. We're going to make Thriller Bark, somehow get it from the West to the Paradise Grand Line. I, once again, don't know how that works. But anyway, we're going to get it there. And then we're going to set up an island of zombies, and we're going to amass a, an army of these zombies, and we're going to take over the world. We're going to eventually go after the One Piece. I think that was his plan initially. Sort of like, you know, he was down on his luck, he stumbled, he lost his whole crew, he was really messed up by that. But then after a couple years, he meets Hogback, he meets Perona, he meets uh, Absalom. Remember, Perona, he was basically like a father to Perona. So maybe that gave him a new lease on life, you know, maybe that gave him a new goal of just like, okay... You know, I might have lost my crew, but now I have a, I have another crew now, okay? And I will cherish them like family. And the, the most of the work will be done by zombies. And zombies, who cares if they die? I could just make more. They're the perfect resource, okay? So I like to think this probably happened somewhere around um, maybe like 15 years ago, something like that, uh, you know, where he was, like, establishing Thriller Bark. Because you would imagine it takes a lot of time to build up an uh, island like Thriller Bark. I mean, you got to get an island from the west, convert it into a pirate ship, get it into the Grand Line. Then you got to amass a bunch of corpses. Do you think think corpses grow on trees? No, man. Hogback probably had to break into the cemetery in the Mihawk section and steal a bunch of corpses. You know what I mean? It was hard. You know, you got to stitch all these things together. It doesn't happen overnight. You know what I mean? So he eventually amassed an army of several hundred zombies. I, I, actually, it was a thousand, wasn't it? When he used Shadows Asgard, he mentioned there were a thousand shadows on Thriller Bark. So a thousand zombies. So I think... About 15-something years ago, they were really kind of, like, gearing up to do this. They were like, we're going to get an awesome armada. We're going after the One Piece. We're taking on the Emperors. But as the years went on, it was sort of like Moria kept procrastinating, kind of kept putting it off. He was eating a lot of Twinkies and Ho-Hos and those little chocolate cakes, those little Debbie chocolate patty cakes that are sandwiches. Oh, they're so good. Zebra cakes. I remember zebra cakes. I think they still sell zebra cakes. My dad, my dad used to work for Coca-Cola when I was growing up, okay? So that's what he did for, like, you know, most of my childhood, right? And uh, every morning for his lunch, uh, he would always pack a cake in his lunch. So I don't know why I just have that childhood memory, but I just remember like this eating zebra cakes with my dad because he would always bring a zebra cake to lunch. Anyway, so um, eventually, though, he gains weight. He kind of gets very slothful. Many people have looked at the seven warlords as a representation of the seven deadly sins. And I've talked about that before. Uh, obviously, wrath would be embodied by uh, Doe Flamingo. Sloth would be Moria. Uh, you could look at uh, Crocodile representing greed. You can look at Jinbe representing pride. You could represent Boa as being lust, obviously. Um, maybe Mihawk would be pride. Uh, maybe you could look at uh, who would be jealousy. Who would represent jealousy? Maybe crocodile. I could see crocodile representing jealousy. Um, what are the other ones here? We have uh, lust, gluttony. Who would be gluttony? Hmm. Gluttony. That's a th like Blackbeard maybe, but Blackbeard was not a member of the original seven. Uh, yeah. The only one left really is Kuma. Yeah. Hmm. Dream Bay representing gluttony is not really fair. I mean, he's just big boned, ladies and gentlemen. But whatever. That's that's a that's a thing that you guys can comment that down below. That'll be a good comment discussion. There you go. Seven warlords, seven deadly sins. I don't know if Odo was directly going for that, but there are some parallels. But anyway, yeah, Moria just kind of lost his drive. He was just like, you know, because, you know, Thriller Bark was ready a while ago. You know what I mean? Like, they were gathering a lot of bodies and stuff in the Florian Triangle and everything like that and grave robbing. Like, you know, they were probably ready to go, like, five years ago or maybe even longer than that. They had Ryuma. They had the Sword God. Five years ago was when Brook showed up and, you know, um, they had his shadow and everything like that. So they were ready to go. You know what I mean? They were like, Hogback was like, ah, yes, Moria, we're ready to take on the New World whenever you command. And Moria's like, yeah, 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 we'll do it tomorrow. I'm, I, I, there's a new show on Netflix. I have to get caught up on all these on the Ozarks and everything, and just, yeah, we'll do it later. And then like a year goes by, and they're like, Moria, we're ready to go. Let's do it. Like Absalom's this time. It's like, come on, everybody, let's go. I got the general zombies. Let's do it. And ah, you know what? It's just like I gotta. My leg's been acting up the last couple of days. It's kind of achy. 
ah, we'll put it off. And it, like, it was kind of that and that and that until he got complacent. He got complacent. And he's just like, why should I bother when other people can just do it for me? And that became his, his uh, sort of a catchphrase. Like, make me king of the pirates. When is somebody just going to get off their ass and make me king of the pirates already? You know what I mean? That was what he said to all of his zombies and stuff like that. And so, left to his own devices, actually, ironically enough, it was the Straw Hats showing up and wrecking the operation that I think really gave Morius some motivation again. If the Straw Hats never reached Thriller Bark, then maybe Moria would still be there, floating in the sea. Eventually, the Warlord system would have been abolished anyway. That might have given him the drive at that point. But he was just in this mire, this malaise, where he just couldn't escape. It was quite literally the fog of malaise of the Florian Triangle. Ooh, that's symbolic. Um, but yeah, you know, Luffy shows up, boom, punches him out and everything, knocks him out, and all the shadows are returned and everything like that. And he becomes sort of like a joke. Um, he was there at Marine Ford. Jean Bay dealt with him pretty easily. And then after Marine Ford. It was Doflamingo and the Pacifista that took him out. He was rescued by Absalom, and we've went on to all this before. Um, but, you know, he was resting and recovering, and now he's back in action, so to speak. And he's currently captured at Hachinosu. But he's probably not dead. I mean, he could be, because the Kage Kage no Mi, you know, Blackbeard could have stolen it and brought him right back to life. But I don't think he's dead yet, and Perona is there, and maybe Perona would have rescued him with the help of Kobe. So... There's that. There are options on the table for Moria, definitely. I, I want to see him do something cool, uh, just to kind of see him get his groove back, you know? Like, how how Gecko Moria got his groove back. Absolutely. Okay, so he teams up with a peasant farmer, voiced by John Goodman, and they go on an epic adventure together. I wish you the best, Moria. I wish you the best. Moving on to the sixth member that's introduced, and this is during the Amazon Lily arc, we have Boa Hancock, who, when I did that poll to determine who was going to be in the thumbnail, I was like, all right, it's either going to be Mihawk or Boa, pretty confidently. Buggy, he was able to, he was up there too. He was in the finals, but I was like, it's going to be Boa or Mihawk. But it ended up being Mihawk, so we'll talk about Boa. Interestingly enough, Boa was the youngest member of the Warlords at age 31, and she became a Warlord at age 18. If you've noticed so far with the Warlords, most of them are like old dudes that are like in their 40s or 50s right now when the system got abolished. Uh, Crocodile was in his mid-20s when he became a member. Uh, Moria might have been in his like 30s. Uh, Mihawk might have been like in his 20s when he became a member. But Mihawk, I mean, but uh, Boa becoming a member when she was 18 was kind of unique. It wasn't really a thing that happened, okay? And the reason for that was not really because of anything Boa herself did. It was because of the reputation of the Kuja pirates that existed previously previously to her. So we know right now that the former empresses, we know that Granny Neon was a former empress. After Granny Neon, there was uh, Shaki. And then there was another empress that we don't know about that was right before Boa. And then I think that was the empress that was mentioned that caught the love sickness and died. Okay. And then Boa became the new empress at age 18. Okay. 13 years ago. And that's also when she became a warlord because the government knew how terrifying the Kuja were. They're on the island of Amazon Lily, which is strategic strategically located in the Calm Belt, and up until that point, getting to the Calm Belt was kind of difficult because they didn't have Vegapunk's technology really up and running yet with the Sea Prism line ships, and, you know, Sea Kings are nesting there, and the Kuja have the pirate ship with the Yuda, which are these poisonous sea snakes that bite you and, like, just kill you. So the Kuja were a, a force to be reckoned with. They still are, but back then even more so, okay? So as soon as the one Empress passed away and then uh, Boa became the new one, pretty much immediately the government sent a carrier bat and was like, hey, would you like to join? Also, at this point, Boa only had a bounty. She had the uh, the lowest bounty out of all of the warlords and only 80 million when it was frozen, okay? Now, her current bounty is a lot higher, of course. It's like well over 1 billion, um, as with a lot of the other ones. You know, but at the time, you know, 80 million. So I'm thinking she was probably only like maybe she was part of like one excursion or something like that. Right. Like maybe one or two pirate excursions as the empress, as the captain of the Kuja pirates and defeated some other pirates or the Marines or whatever. And then they gave her a bounty of 80. And like the same time they were like, OK, no, we're not dealing with this. We're not dealing with this lady again. We're sending her. We're, we're recruiting her now. OK, because she's going to be a major issue later, like the all the other empresses were also. 
also her appointment to Warlord was a little bit more of a political thing as well to ally with the Kuja once again to be like, okay, there's this island that's not really allied with the world government and uh, it isn't now anyway. So it's like we need to figure out some other way to like have good relations with them okay and so that would be a good way to do it and even with the case of being a warlord you know there's not really a lot of rules to it pretty much the rules are just don't attack marines uh kill other pirates and kind of show up when we summon you that's pretty much the only rules you, you don't have to work together usually you don't have to get along with each other and we'll honestly just kind of you're not supervised we'll honestly let you do kind of whatever you want to do um as long as you're not directly like attacking or killing members of the government the marines or the cypher pole right so when they summoned her to marine ford boa was like no, <laughs> you know, and he's like, no, I'm not going. Screw you, you know, and they're like, but we'll revoke your status. And Boa's like, go ahead, do it. I dare you, you know, and that's more of just Boa being very, very arrogant. So that's just her just being like, oh, sure. Revoke my status. Send the Marines. I can take them, you know, and I feel like Boa's maybe improved on that a little bit, maybe because meeting Luffy or whatever. Um, but it's also like a situation where, like, if the Marines really went at Amazon Lily in force, I feel like they could probably take it. You know, they I mean like especially with Vegapunk's technology and the SSG and everything like that. Um, they got pretty close with the Seraphim from what we saw. Now Rayleigh showed up and Blackbeard was there, so that kind of threw a wrench in the whole operation. But let's say Blackbeard never showed up. Let's say Rayleigh never showed up, and it was just the uh, the Kuja facing off against the Marines with Kobe there, with Vice Admirals and Rear Admirals and the Seraphim. I don't think that would have ended well. I think they probably would have ended up capturing Boa and kind of gives you the idea of Boa declaring to Momonga two years ago before the war of like, revoke my title. I don't care. You know, that really just screams of just profound arrogance, you know, that that Boa kind of represents there. OK, but like I said, she's she's doing better as of late. OK, we haven't seen Boa kick a puppy or a baby otter in the last few hundred chapters. So maybe she's kicked that habit. I really hope she has, okay? So yeah, um, Boa also regarded as the most beautiful woman on the entire world, the pirate empress. Uh, everyone falls before her beauty. She ate the love love fruit, the meto meto no me. And so she has the love love beam to turn people into stone like the uh, Medusa of Greek mythology. Um, so unless Perseus shows up to cut off her head, I guess it's pretty much indispensable at this point um we're seeing a lot of applications with her ability now because s snake exists as one of the seraphim and egghead there um so the last time we saw her is when she um uh, was you know, uh, facing off against Blackbeard. Blackbeard wanted her ability to steal the power. Um, and so it also gives you the idea of the Mara Maranomi because Blackbeard wanted it. And it's like, okay, if he wanted the power, uh, I don't think the fruit makes you attractive. I think that was just Boa already. I think the fruit might work for like any sort of like, so if like, if Blackbeard got the fruit and like somebody looked up to Blackbeard or was maybe even like, um, I, I don't know, like maybe terrified of Blackbeard or something like that. Maybe the fruit would have worked in that regard. Blackbeard really wanted it. So the implication was Blackbeard was aware of the fruit's abilities and how it works and that he could use it for himself, okay? Uh, also, though, he might not have because Boa was like, oh, if you kill me and take my power, you won't be able to return your men from stone, even though, you know, I'm the one that turned them to stone. Even though you get the power next, you won't be able to turn them back. Now, it's a question of, like, how did Boa know that? Well, she might have known that, well, uh, well, uh, because she didn't get the power. I was going to say because the previous empress had the power, but no, she didn't. She got that power force-fed to her by the Tenrubito. They literally force-fed the devil fruits to her and her sisters just for just for laughs, okay, just to torment them. Um, so I don't know. Maybe she did know the former member of the uh, Love Love Fruit. Maybe she was in prison with them while they were at Amazon. No, while they were at Marie Joie. Uh, the other maybe it was another prisoner that had the Love Love Fruit that had then died because of the Tenrubito's treatment of them and so the fruit was reincarnated and the tenorubito were like oh she died all right give this other one the power of the love love fruit it'll be funny you know what i mean so yeah 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 it might have been something like that so she might have known already or she might have just been bluffing to blackbeard to be like you kill me you won't be able to return your men from stone and then blackbeard's like Zaha, 
I'm willing to take that risk. And then that's when Rayleigh shows up and then kind of, you know, pushes that, that aside and is like, okay, everybody go home. Everybody go home. Dark King is here and Dark King is cranky. I need my coffee. Get going. You know what I mean? He's like, all right, shit. All right, sorry, Rayleigh. You know, they, they all leave, right? Gotta love Rayleigh. So she's recovering from her wounds. She's Amazon Lily, though. So whether or not maybe she's going to head into the new world and see if she can help out Luffy and all, she would certainly be a fan of that. And staying on Amazon Lily might not be a smart idea right now. So we'll see what happens with Boa. Okay. So now moving on to Blackbeard. That's right. Not moving on to Jinbei because... If I'm going about how they were introduced as warlords, right? So technically speaking, the first time Blackbeard was mentioned in One Piece was during Drum Island. The first time he was actually shown in full view in the present was um, at Jaya. You know, like, dreams will never die, that kind of stuff. However, he was not a warlord yet. Then he defeated Ace. Uh, and I think he did not officially become a warlord until Thriller Bark, because when Kuma arrived at Thriller Bark to speak to Moria, he mentioned, like, I'm here to tell you that uh, Blackbeard, Marshal D. Teach, has become a member of the warlords in Crocodile's place. So it was turning Ace over to the Marines. That was the thing. Yeah, Lafitte had showed up prior to kind of put forward Blackbeard's application to the role, but it wasn't made official until post Ennie's Lobby, okay? And then Thriller Bark. But we still didn't see Blackbeard yet until it was after Amazon Lily. It was right before the war, kind of at, like, kind of in between Amazon Lily and Impel Down when the seven warlords were all getting together to kind of just have a meal together and have a party. That is when Blackbeard was first shown right there as a member of the Seven Warlords. And Jinbei did not show up until a few chapters later. So that's just how it goes, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so Blackbeard. Honestly, this is going to be pretty quick because the whole reason Blackbeard became a warlord was just for his own devices, okay? It was just part of this big plan of subterfuge to get the power of uh, the Guru Guru no Mi from Whitebeard, okay? Kind of doing that, right? So it was, uh, and also to get a bunch of his crew out of, well, to get a crew out of level six. They weren't his crew pri previously, but like, I'm going to get into level six. I'm going to release some of the worst criminals of the world and get them to work for me. That was really his main plan, okay? So it's like, all right. Um, Crocodile was defeated by Luffy. We can take advantage of this, him and his crew. So, like, they see sent Lafitte. We should put him in my application. Thing is, Blackbeard was a relatively unknown pirate at this point. He had zero bounty. He was on Whitebeard's crew, but nobody really knew a lot about him because he kind of laid low all those years. But he had the power of the Yami Yami no Mi. So, you know, they didn't make him a warlord right then and there at that meeting, but they knew his name now, okay? And so then... He had to kind of make a name for himself, so he was going to go to Water 7 to capture Luffy after Ennis Lobby, but then Ace showed up at Bonaro Island, and they fought, and so, oh, okay, I'll just bring Ace in. You know, Fire Fist Ace, second commander of the damn Whitebeard, uh, you know, uh, uh, commando unit or whatever. That'll be that'll be a, a good gift for the government. That'll make, him me a, that'll make me a warlord, and so he does that, and he does. He does become a warlord through that, okay? And so then... After that, immediately, he's like, all right, well, I turned in Ace. That's going to start a war, which it does. Whitebeard's going to be there. So then that's when the gears start turning in, in Teach's head. That's when he starts thinking about, like, all right, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use the fact that this war is going to start. I'm going to get uh, the prisoners out of level six, and then I'm going to go to Marineford, and I'm going to get, you know, Whitebeard's fruit, the Guru Guru no Mi, and I'm going to shock the world, and then I'm going to move on to my next stage. Crazy plan, but it worked. So using his warlord credentials, he was able to go to Impel Down, force his way in there, get in, get all the prisoners out, defeated by, he got defeated by Magellan, which I still find very funny. Shiryu saved him, though. Gets all the prisoners out, goes to Marine Ford, uses Lafitte's hypnotism to open the gates of justice. He really thought this out. Gets there, and then gets the power of the Guru Guru no Mi, and as soon as he does that, he's done. Doesn't need to be there anymore, and he immediately is is rescinded. I, I don't know if he's like, he's like, you can't fire me, I quit! Say ha 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 ha! And so he moves on to his next stage of the plan, which was becoming an emperor, which he succeeded in. So, two years later, he becomes an emperor. So he was probably the one that was the emperor. Now, he was probably one that was the warlord for the shortest amount of time. Probably only, like, maybe a month or so, maybe even less than that. Um, depends when he was officially made a warlord, because the war was happening, and so they needed seven warlords. They needed to fill that slot that Crocodile had opened up. That's also why they didn't immediately revoke the title from Moria, because Moria had just been defeated by Luffy, but it's like, okay, we cannot... 
it's it's too late. We're going to be fighting against Whitebeard any day now. We can't afford to kick Moria out and recruit another member, so screw it. Moria is still a warlord. We'll deal with him after the war. And they did. In the, well, they tried to with Doflamingo and the Pacifista, right? So at the end of the war, basically, you only had four of the warlords. And four, yeah, that's already copyright infringement on the Yonko. You can't have the four emperors and the four warlords. Somebody's going to sue, right? So it's like, okay, we lost. We had to kick out Moria because he was too weak. Blackbeard left and Jinbei left. So we need three more members, okay? And so then through the course of the time skip, we get three more members of the warlords, okay? But not before we talk about the last member of the original seven warlords, Jinbei, the first son of the sea. Okay, and so he's the only Fishman member of the Warlords. Um, and yeah, he was the second mentioned by Yosaku, but last revealed, okay? So, uh, Jinbei's life, I'm actually planning on doing a whole video about him. Remember when I did my uh, Straw Hat discussion series? Well, of course, I gotta do one on Jinbei now. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So, I'm gonna leave most of the stuff about his backstory for that video, okay? But, um, of course... His backstory is closely connected to Fisher Tiger, uh, who is the leader of the Sun Pirates. Of course, the relations between merfolk, fishmen, and the humans has always been really uh, rocky throughout, you know, all of history, right? Uh, up until 200 years ago, they were basically just viewed as fish and nothing more. Um, so eventually, though, after the events of, like, Fisher Tiger being enslaved and then returning and then forming a crew, they were going out in the world and trying to free as many slaves as possible. Eventually, Fisher Tiger dies. He gets betrayed and killed. And so Jinbei becomes the captain of the Sun Pirates, and it's at that point where he's invited to join the Warlords. This is about 11 years ago. So he joins, and, and the reason he joins is because he feels this is in line with Tiger and Otohime's wish that this would increase relationships between Fishman Island and Marijua and the world, because the ultimate goal of all the fishmen and merfolk is to live under the sun, just like everybody else, not in the depths of the ocean, okay? And so maybe Jinbei felt like, all right, if I join, then maybe I can make something work with that. Now, uh, an unfortunate side effect of that was when Jinbei joined Arlong, who had been imprisoned and impelled down because he was captured by Kizaru, was therefore released as part of like a bargaining ship or whatever. And so Arlong, of course, we all know what he ended up doing. He ended up going to the East Blue, setting up Arlong Park, and then tormenting Nami, killing Belmere, and Kokoyashi Village for years to come. Okay, and that's involved in Nami's backstory, of course. So Jinbei was, you know, even like Jinbei, who's a genuinely good guy, who joined the Warlords with the best possible intentions, still indirectly caused a lot of suffering for Nami and Nojiko in the East. One could say that if Jinbei never became a Warlord, Arlong would have just stayed an impel down. He never would have went to the East, and Nami would have never lost Belmere, and Kokoyashi would have just been a happy village, and that's it. And also, by extension, Nami probably would have never joined the Straw Hats in that regard. So, Jinbei joining the Warlords actually had a profound effect on what would later become, like, the Straw Hat crew. That's what I love about Oda's writing. He fits all of this together, right? So, because of Jinbei's sensibilities, uh, he was against the war. He did not want to fight. He's like, I'm not fighting in the war. You're not going to make me. And he's like, we're going to make you. He's like, you can't make me. He's like, we're going to make you. He's like, what are you going to do, lock me up? Level six, you know what I mean? And then they lock him up in level six in the same cell as Ace, so they get to talk a little bit and communicate. Uh, he gets the crap beat out of him by Minotaros on a daily business. And Jinbei is still like that iron will of Jinbei is just like, you know, even though it hurts Ace, even though it's it's bleeding and it hurts, my heart aches even more. You know what I mean? So Jinbei, dude, he's a total boss, dude. I love Jinbei. So he showed up there, and of course... We, the first time we really get to see him in action is when he's freed and he's working alongside Luffy and Ivankov and everybody breaking out of Impel Down. We get to see his Fishman Karate! Like, probably the greatest master of Fishman Karate in the entire world right now is Jinbei. Busting through Impel Down, getting to Marine Ford, beating the shit out of Moria, announcing to Sengoku, you know, I, rev I rescind my title as Warlord, you can have it! You know what I mean? And Sengoku's like, Grr, Jinbei! You know, it's just like, how dare 
are you? You know, and um, of course, then we get the moment at Fishman Island where he helps fight the, you know, the uh, new Fishman pirates like Watatsume. He helps defeat him, and then Luffy and him share blood. And like I said, I'm, I'm I'm glossing over a lot of it, but this is more about his life as a warlord, and he gives that up, you know, relatively early on, you know, when he shows up, you know, shortly thereafter. Uh, one could argue, actually, when he is first introduced, he's no longer a warlord anymore. He's kind of already made up his mind at that point. So technically speaking, did we ever even see Jinbei operating as a warlord? I guess we did in flashbacks when he fought Ace, I guess, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, so um, they share blood. Luffy asks him to join his crew, and he does... 10 years later in the manga, but yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, he does, yeah. Not 10 years in the manga, 10 years in the actual manga. Like, the, the 10 years are time. So, he does, he does. He's a member now. He's a member now. It's all that matters. He'll be getting a pop figurine soon. Uh, if he doesn't already have one, he might already have one. And then I'll be making my discussion video about him. So, he's currently the helmsman aboard the Straw Hat Pirate Ship with a bounty of 1 billion, 100 million, my God. Goodness, Jean Bay. Damn, son. That's impressive. So that would be all of the warlords that we saw pre-time skip, okay? So we got the original seven, and then Blackbeard, who joined in place of Crocodile. But like I said, after the events of Marineford, you got a few openings now, okay? So over the course of the two years, three new pirates are enlisted in the warlords. Now, we don't get to spend as much time with them. Um, I mean, as warlords, uh, Law, we do a little bit, and he's going to be the next person we're going to be talking about. Trafalgar D, Water Law. But the other ones are kind of just off to the side. We only get to see them briefly as warlords before their titles are revoked, okay? Well, anyway, yes. So, Law. Law was the first one to become a warlord after the time skip, and I believe... Well, no, actually, it was Buggy. Buggy became a warlord first, but the way that we're doing this is... We knew Buggy was announced as a warlord at the end of uh, the time skip, before the time skip. He got the carrier bat message, but we actually didn't know what that said. We weren't sure 100% he was a warlord. It was just a letter from the government. You could assume, but we didn't know for certain. And then I don't think we actually saw Buggy as a warlord until post... It was either post-Punk Hazard or post-Dress Rosa, one of the two. Um, and I think it was post-Punk Hazard. So that would mean that, yes, we saw Law showing up at Punk Hazard, opening the door to the lab, standing there with the cool suit and the cool jacket with, uh, with Smoker there and everything. Like, that was when Law was revealed, I think, as the first new Warlord for certain after the time skip. So, yes, I did not mess that up. Right. So... Law, very tactical, very intelligent man, all right? And so all the other supernovas, except for the Straw Hats, except for Luffy and Zoro and the Straw Hats, they all go out into the New World, okay? Like Apu and Kid and Hawkins and Drake, they all go to the New World immediately after Marineford. Law decides, mm, not yet. We're not ready yet. Everybody's rushing to the New World immediately. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be a cluster. Tell you what, we're going to hang back for a little bit, and we're going to figure this out. So... They don't do the exact same thing the Straw Hats did, where they trained for two years to get stronger, but Law went about this a different way. They probably did train a little bit, planning out their strategy, and Law was like, okay. Kind of the same thing with Blackbeard. Blackbeard noticed an, you know, an opening in the Warlords, and he took advantage of that. Law saw the same thing. All the other members of the Supernovas just get going. It's like, wait a second. There are three openings to the seven Warlords of the Sea right now. I could take advantage of that. Because Law's ultimate goal is to take down Doflamingo. That was, like, his big thing ever since he left Doflamingo. And he's, like, he's planning this, and he's, like, wait a second, okay. I could do something with this. Doflamingo's a warlord. I could become a warlord. I could kind of get in that organization. I could kind of mess with things. The government won't really know. And then Doflamingo works for Kaido. If I can piss off Kaido sufficiently, Kaido beats the crap out of Doflamingo. Corazon avenged. My my job's done, you know? So what he does is there's two events here. There's the event where Law sends a hundred pirate hearts to Marineford. <laughs> and there's the Rocky Port incident. So let's talk about the heart thing. The first thing is like, okay, how am I going to What's my application going to be for the Warlords? Blackbeards was sending a mime to dance around Marijua. That was his plan. Law decided to go a little bit more macabre with this. He's just like, I'm going to rip out a hundred pirate hearts, throw them into a box, and then ship them FedEx style to the Marines. <laughs> and it worked. I mean, 
yeah, you know, like the Marines are like, Trafalgar D won't log. Oh, I guess they don't know he's the D. Trafalgar log, get on the ground. And he's just like, hold on, guys, hold on. I'm here to put in my application for the warlords. Are those hearts? Yeah. Why are they still beating? Yeah. Just, okay, just hold on one minute, sir. We'll get you into the... Hello there, this is the secretary speaking. Uh, he he has a lot of hearts. Uh, can we uh, maybe uh, you know get a meeting with him? Just like, okay, so they sit down and they discuss the plans. Like, so you want to be a warlord? Well... We have a lot of, we have a bronze package, a silver package, you know what I mean? With the platinum package is really good. Mihawk's been on that one. He's really good. He's like, well, I was like, I'll, I'll just go with the bronze package for right now. Really? Are you sure? Because the last person to go with the bronze package was Blackbeard, and he was only a member for like a couple of uh, a weeks. So I, I don't know. That doesn't really give us a lot. Of, you don't seem dedicated to this organization law. It's like, okay, okay, okay. Okay, if I go with the silver package, what's my, you know, subscription fee? It's like, well, you know, with the silver package, you have to deliver us at least 100 pirates every year, but that doesn't look like it's going to be a problem for you. But in exchange, you get your own island, uh, your own hideout. Um, now, there are some restrictions here. You're not allowed to have any kind of add-ons like Olympic-sized poles or anything. That's with the gold package. Um, <laughs> it is, I, was, I don't know. I was going with that. But he became a warlord that way, okay? And so he set up operations at Punk Hazard to kind of begin the downfall of Doflamingo. This was like a multi-step plan. He knows Doflamingo has the smiles. He's brokering the smiles as Joker to the rest of the underworld. The smiles are made out of SAD, SAD, which are which is produced at Punk Hazard by Caesar Clown. So he's like, okay, step one, I got to get an infiltrate Punk Hazard to deal with the SAD, eliminate that supply so Doflamingo can't make smiles, and so Kaido gets mad at him, okay? And so once again, I don't think Law planned on the Straw Hat getting involved here but they did and so law kind of had to like rework his plan a little bit and be like okay uh how about we you me and you work together we form an alliance so we take down kaido and luffy's like yeah sure that's cool so they get rid of caesar they leave punk hazard they go to dress row so law has this plan to get doflamingo ousted as a warlord doesn't really work out too well fujitora shows up and revokes law's title because law is allied with the straw hats essentially law's whole i mean the whole reason he became a warlord was really just to learn maybe a little bit more about doflamingo and also punk hazard uh was an island you can't really usually get to so it's just like i'll be a warlord it'll make it easier to like set up operations there nobody will question it and so after that was all done though by the time dress rosa happens and fujitora revokes his title law kind of already did everything he wanted to do as a warlord anyway so he's like that ah, screw it yeah me and the straw hats are allies and then fujitora is like you are no longer a warlord then he's like eh eh what are you gonna do okay easy come easy go so he was not a warlord for very long i would say maybe about a year or so maybe a year and a half i like to think law was no it was buggy but Buggy and then Law and then Weevil were the last members to be recruited in that order, okay? So, we all know about Law. I did literally an entire series, an entire week, Law Week, about Law. So, you can go check that out. But that was the situation there with him. Uh, moving on now to Buggy, the man of the hour, the myth, the legend, the clown. We all know him. We all love him. Buggy D. Clown. All right, so... The man that basically bullshitted his way into the status of a warlord and then proceeded to extra bullshit his way into the status of emperor. Can we just have a round of applause for Buggy? Absolutely. Okay. So, Buggy, former member of the Pirate King's crew as an apprentice, as a, as a cabin boy, so to speak, uh, alongside Shanks. Uh, unlike Shanks, decides to basically set up operation in the East. He's like, I don't want to go back to the Grand Line. That was really scary. Once again, it was the Straw Hats that was really the impetus for that, that lit a fire under Buggy's ass and was just like, you know, I'm going to go to the Grand Line. I'm going to defeat the Straw Hats. I was a member of the Gold Goldie Rogers crew. I could do this. I was a member of the King of the Pirates crew. We could do this. So they go to the Grand Line. He gets captured, gets thrown an impel down, gets broken out, and, you know, everybody finds out at this point who he is and his pedigree and everything like that. So after the events of Marine Ford, and he didn't die because he's super lucky, um, the government makes him a warlord. And he's like, oh, okay. And so he sets up this operation, takes a small loan of a of a billion berries from uh, Crocodile, I guess, and then sets up Kalibali Island and Buggy's Delivery Service. Buggy was smart. He's like, I'm not going to fight on my own, but what I could do 
is I could set up a pirate mercenary business. And that's what he does because he already had a bunch of the uh, prisoners from Impel Down that basically viewed him as their messiah figure that saved them from the hell of Impel Down and rescued them, you know, parting the seas so they could escape, parting the, the gates of justice so they could escape. Um, that was another example of, of um, you know, music in One Piece that was like an orchestral score that already existed. It was like, uh, not Ave Maria. It was like, oh, what was it? Like, da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Is that Beethoven? I don't know. Da, 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 da. That's kind of what played when they he opened the gates of justice. So, um, yeah, he's like, hey, man, I got a bunch of these high-ranking pirates from Impel Down. Most of them are all stronger than me. Um, you know, I'm going to recruit more pirates. I'm a warlord. I have the status now, so screw it. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to build up the really big island. I'm going to party and hang out, and then all my other, all my men are the ones that are actually going to go out and, you know, you know, pirates delivery, and they're going to attack and everything, and do mercenary jobs and stuff for the government. Yeah, that works perfectly. So Buggy actually does have some business sense. Now, maybe Alvita and Moji and Kabaji were the ones that kind of, like, pushed him, like, hey, maybe we should work with this instead, but Buggy, you know, He's charismatic. He's not evil, but he's charismatic, and that goes a long way, you know what I mean? So, Buggy, we didn't really get to see him really doing much as a warlord, though, unfortunately. We know, like, Hyrudin and the Giants worked for him. We knew a little bit about Buggy's delivery. There was, like, different tiers, like S tier, A tier of different, like, mercenaries, and the uh, Giants were in the highest tier. Um, but, unfortunately, we only got to see him a few times before the the entire system was abolished at the reverie. And then he's like, oh no, okay, man, we're going to give him hell as I sneak out the back. And so then Crocodile showed up to get his, his money back. He's like, hey, you own interest on my uh, loan, clown. It's like, oh man, I don't know. And then Mihawk showed up and he's like, okay, I tell you what, how about we all work together as a happy little organization? I don't have any money, but I do have a bunch of, I, I have the operation, I have all these men, I have the island, I have a printing press, we can do this. And then so they're like, okay, yeah, Crocodile's like all right it's not a bad idea i guess no mihawk was the one that's like all right that's not a bad idea i suppose but i'm not taking orders from you i'll be like oh yeah no of course not i'll take orders from you i'll do whatever you want you want me to go get you mcdonald's i'll get you mcdonald's mihawk's like i prefer wendy's I'm like okay shit all right i'll get you wendy's damn here you go here's a four for four okay you know what i mean yeah so um yeah that's buggy as a warlord it's it's sad we didn't see the buggy's delivery service really in full swing like how it really operated i think you could really you could do like a buggy gaiden you could do like a buggy side story of how he like you know set up his um delivery service and how it operated and stuff like that and how all the pirates from this side of the grand line bowed and, and were either in in fear or respect of Buggy the Clown. Yeah. But it's not like Buggy was demoted or anything. If anything, he was promoted. You know, Buggy D. Clown, you have been promoted to Emperor of the Sea. It's like, what? And so he becomes a Yonko, and Buggy now has a bounty of 3,189,000,000. <laughs> just, he started out as just a humble clown. You know, doing some street routines in the East Blue. Look at him now, ladies and gentlemen. Look at... Hold on. I'm sitting down for too long. <laughs> look at him now, ladies and gentlemen. Look at him now. Thanks to Luffy420 for drawing this. But look at him now. All right, so... With that being said, we now come to the final member of the seven, eight, nine, eleven warlords of the sea. Almost a dozen. Almost made it to a dozen. It could have been a dozen warlords of the sea. Could have been a, a baker's dozen, maybe even. If you added a 13th member, that would have actually worked. 13 members of the sea. Ooh. Anyway, we have Edward Weevil. Okay, now Weevil, you know, we didn't, you thought we didn't see a lot of Buggy, at least we knew about Buggy, like Buggy was an established character at least. Weevil just comes out of the great wild blue yonder, has like, I think actually maybe just one scene before his, his title is revoked. He shows up with his mom, Miss Bucking, who we find out is Miss Buckingham Stussy, who is the, um, the, the, mother of Stussy from Cypher Pole Zero. Stussy, that's a Cypher Pole Zero agent, is a clone of Buckingham Stussy, who she worked for Mads way back in the day, okay? So that's his mom, and Weevil might also be a clone of Wipeer, because everybody's a clone now in One Piece. So Weevil's just this huge brute, you know, ridiculously strong, IQ of about a bag of Doritos, you know, you know, the spicy chili, in case you're curious. And so, um, yeah, he's just this like, Mama, I'm going to break all the pirates' heads because they killed Whitebeard. I want to take on Blackbeard, you know what I mean? 
So why, uh, Weevil's like that. He's not very smart. He just kind of obeys whatever his mom says. But also, he's very dedicated to the story of him being Whitebeard's son. Even if he isn't technically Whitebeard's son, he might be a clone of Whitebeard. Um, but even if he isn't really, he still cares for Whitebeard's family, and he protected Sphinx Island to the point where he was even captured by Aramaki, who is Green Bull. Okay, so that's his current status right now. But yeah, Weevil showed up. Uh, introduced as one of the w members there with his mom, uh, where he defeated the A and O pirates, and then in the next scene, I think it was when the warlords were abolished and the marines showed up with the riot shields trying to bring them in, and he's like, "Mama, they're here," and he's like, "Well, you could defeat them." He's like, "Okay," you know, he's just like they were supposed to be our friends, you know. So yeah, Weevil, we really didn't see much of him at all. Honestly, even now we still don't know much of him, other than the fact we're finding out more stuff about Weevil secondhand. I don't really think we're gonna get down with Weevil as like a flashback. I don't think Weevil's gonna be like, "Hello, Straw Hats, allow me to tell you the story of my past." So when I was a little boy, I was growing up in a tank, just like everybody else, and then I was born, and then I was told that I was Whitebeard's son, you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah, 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 I, I don't think Weevil's gonna be the one to reveal this. It's gonna be Miss Buckingham or somebody, but currently, Weevil is imprisoned. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean he's on a prison ship? Does that mean he's at Marine Ford? Does that mean he's gonna be taken to Impel Down? Or if there's some kind of prison in the New World, because Impel Down's still in Paradise? Who knows? I don't know, but maybe somebody knows. Oda probably knows. So, Miss Bucking asked Marco to help her rescue her son. Marco does have a debt of gratitude to pay for Weevil because otherwise Sphinx would have been, like, ravaged by the Marines. But at the same time, it's like Marco cannot leave because... You know what I mean? He just left for Wano, and look what happened. So it's like, I can't leave, but I like to think Marco's going to make some phone calls to some other former members of Whitebeard's crew, like Vista, uh, Jozu maybe, and be like, hey guys, you know, Pops' island was almost taken over by Marines. Weevil saved them. He was captured by Aramaki. I can't leave, but can you guys help him? I mean, whether or not he's Whitebeard's son, whether or not Miss Bakin was Whitebeard's lover he still saved Whitebeard's homeland. So, you know, I think Pops would want us to help him out if we could, you know what I mean? And maybe Jozu and, and Vista, Fossa, Speed Jiru, King Du, Namur, and everybody get together and they're like, we'll, we'll, we'll help him out. Don't worry about it, Marco. If you're the one asking us, we'll help you. No problems. So, yeah. Sorry about Izo. Yeah, it was sad. Okay. Anyway. I think we're done. <laughs> we're done. That was, oh man, that was a long one. I knew that was going to be a long one. But I'm glad I have that out there. I was looking, I was just looking at all my videos recently, like the older stuff, and I was like, man, I really haven't done a Warlord video in a, in a while. I did the individual ones. I, I need to do, I need to redo the Yonko series too, because when I first did that Yonko series with Kaido and Big Mom, like we didn't even really know anything about Kaido yet. We don't know really anything about Shanks yet. So now we know way more. So I should do a new Yonko series, um, at least talking about Shanks and um, Blackbeard you know, on a new level at that point. I've made a, a bunch of Kaido videos. We've done the the who, what, where, when, and why Kaidos. I think the only one I haven't made yet is when is Kaido. So um, I guess I could make a video on, like, when is Kaido returning or something like that. But um, I think that's the only one yet left. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Techie signing out. Glad you enjoyed the video. Uh, hope you did anyway. You might have just, you know, used this to fall asleep, which still weirds me out that people can do that. Um, but okay. Um, I told... I was at dinner with friends a couple nights ago, and uh, we were talking about my YouTube channel at one point, and I mentioned that, like, yeah, there's people that say they, they use my videos as, like, podcasts, and they just fall asleep to them, and my one friend just looks at me, my friend's wife uh, looks at me and just, like, I have no idea how they're able to do that. You know, that that is weird, and I'm just like, yeah, I know, I think it's weird, too, but it's just, like, it's strange. So, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Tech King signing out. Later.